So we're talking about uh, the, the parentheses that is there. And the parentheses that, that he has, uh, there was a thought of in verse number six, hey, there's going to be a judgment. There's going to be a time where we will all stand before God, the righteous and the unrighteous, some unto condemnation and some unto commendation. And uh, he, uh, he was talking about how some had died in their faith because they were willing to suffer for Christ. They were not only willing to suffer, they were willing to give their life and they died. And, and so he kind of ends that thought there in verse number six about uh, them, yes, being dead now, being condemned by those evil rulers that were in the world at their time in their life. But it wasn't always going to be that way. So then verse seven, he goes into this thought, you know, the end of all things is coming. And he was just encouraging the Christians uh, while we see that the Lord's return is getting closer each week and each day, then uh, we need to be praying more fervently. We need to be loving one another uh, more deeply. And we, we really need to be serving for the kingdom, for that which is eternal. And uh, in verse number 11, he kind of closes that thought there. It was just a parenthesis. It was just like, hey, I just want you to, to remember that and, and just remember that our God has dominion over all things and to him be glory for all things. And, and he ends verse 11 there. Then in verse number 12, which is what we're going to study today, he comes back to the idea of suffering. And he begins to reflect a little bit and he asks those that are reading this letter, I want you to reflect a little bit on suffering. Now, I believe that every Christian should have a time in their life where they stop and they reflect in their life. As Christians, I believe that we ought to stop and reflect upon the salvation that we have received. I don't think that we do that enough as Christians. I believe that we take it for granted so easily sometimes that we have been forgiven, that we have been redeemed, that we are actually the family of God. I think so many times that just kind of washes over us like water on a duck's back. It just doesn't really sink in. But we ought to be reflective of that. We ought to stop and be reflective about God's goodness to us in our lives. We ought to stop and be reflective about God's creation and just kind of marvel at the God uh, that we serve. I mean, his creation is unbelievable. Uh, this past weekend, we had some uh, people over at our house and and uh, this uh, husband's name was TJ and I was talking with TJ and we started talking about uh, just kind of the animal kingdom and how much in the animal kingdom we can learn about God and how God is and it just amazing the the instinct that animals have and where did they get to learn we we're talking about uh, about uh, uh, puppies and stuff and we, and we were just saying uh, where where do these dogs get get this idea of how to take care of them and and uh, once they're born they just know how to take care of puppies like, who taught them that? They, there is no teaching that. And it's just amazing to see that that's what our creator did. Uh, and, and just be reflective about his creation. I think we ought to stop and reflect about God's mercy in our lives. And, and when we think about what we really deserve in life, and yet how God has withheld that from us. And he's been so merciful and so gracious to us. I think we should uh, stop and reflect on those things. But I think if Peter... We're here this morning in person. He would say, I think you need to stop and reflect upon suffering in your life as well. I think there's a time that you need to stop and pause and say, do we really understand what this suffering is all about? Do, do we really understand why God's allowing this suffering? And, and have we really stopped and paused and just reflected on suffering in our life? Because you see, what reflection does for us is that reflection will, one, help us sometimes to have understanding of the situation. Uh, sometimes when, when, you're, when you, you don't stop to reflect, you, you just feel like you're in the middle of a, of a, of a tornado and you're just kind of uh, going and getting dizzy and everything's moving around you and there's chaos all about. And, and you, you just it's hard to stop and just be reflective there. And sometimes you, you kind of instead of being reflective, just get in that position and go, why? And get angry or get bitter. And, and, uh, and, and, and that's not the way that you deal with it. Reflection, what will happen is it'll give you some, some understanding of a situation. But sometimes reflection also will give you strength to continue and to endure through something. Being reflective. 
when you can stop and say, you know, God has gotten me through worse. I think he'll get me through this. God, God's done it before, and I know that he'll do it again. Reflection does that. It gives you strength to continue uh, and to endure certain suffering in your life. I, I love the way that uh, someone once put it. They said, sometimes we as Christians need to stop along life's road and look back. Although it might have been winding and steep, we can see how God directed us by his faithfulness. F.E. Marshall described what the Christian can see when he looks back. He said, according to Deuteronomy 5.15, you can see the deliverances that the Lord has wrought. Deuteronomy 8.2, we can look back and see the way that he has led us. Deuteronomy 32, you can look back and see the blessings that he has bestowed. Deuteronomy 11, you can look back and see the victories that he has won. Look at Joshua 23, and you can see the encouragements that he has given. And sometimes when we face difficulties, we sometimes forget God's past faithfulness. We can see detours and the dangerous path, but when you look back, you can also see the joy of victory the challenge of the climb and the presence of your traveling companion who has promised to never leave you nor forsake you. That's why it's so important to stop and reflect. And so now Peter, after closing that little parenthesis on the end of all things, now continues writing about suffering in verse number 12. And now we find that his focus on suffering is slightly different. While in chapters Three and two, he's been looking on what to do during suffering and how we should act and who should we look to. And, and at the end of chapter three, we were looking at Christ as the example for us of uh, going through suffering and what we should do in suffering. Here in verse 12 of chapter four, he, he begins to be reflective about suffering. So this morning, I want to share at least four tests that we should take during times of suffering. As we consider why of the suffering, I want to share a few thoughts that Peter writes about here from verse 12 all the way to the end of the chapter in verse number 19. I want you to notice, first of all, if you're taking notes, that the first test that we should ask ourselves is to examine our attitudes. Examine our attitudes. Notice what he says in verse number 12. He says, Beloved, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. I love the way that he begins as he starts this section of reflection. He, he uses that word beloved. It's, it's, a, it's a term uh, that uh, means uh, with all love. Uh, he, he, he's trying to describe, if he can, with, with, the, with the word here, the, the, the kindness and uh, the, the dearness that these people that are going through suffering uh, are to his heart. He didn't say, hey, you guys. He, he, he wasn't writing that way. When he writes beloved, it's because there was some love there. There's a, a connection there. Uh, the Apostle Peter was someone that knew about suffering firsthand. It wasn't something that he was talking about that he heard about, but rather something he had gone through himself. And I don't know about you, but whenever you've gone through something and you hear someone else going through the same thing, there's a greater connection that you have with that person. There's something that you have of understanding of them that perhaps even they themselves don't understand quite yet. For instance, if you've lost a loved one that was close to you, you know the hurt that's there. You know the separation. You know the difficulty. And now when you see someone else lose their loved one, somehow there's a connection there that you, you can understand it a little bit better. You, you, you can at least in your mind, whether we say it to them or not, we can at least say, in our mind, I know how you feel. I've been there. And you know the hurt. And when you talk to them, usually you talk to them a lot more loving than maybe someone that hasn't. Not that someone that hasn't, you know, expresses it so callously. Uh, 
but they're more than just uh, platitudes that you say when you've gone through that. Uh, suddenly, it's not like, man, well, I, 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 you know, be praying for you. No, there, there's more to it. There's something that even in your voice they can tell because they know. And so when Peter starts this verse off here in verse number 12, starting this section of reflection, he, he says, beloved, or my dear loved ones, he said, think. Think. This is the, the first reflective thought and word that we see in this passage. He wants to begin here, and he wants us to use our minds. He wants those that are going through suffering, he says, uh, those that I love, that are going through what I've been through. Be reflective. Think. Think. And he says, what's the first thought that we ought to think about as we reflect upon our suffering? Well, number one is that suffering should not be surprising. He says, think, notice in verse number 12, think it not strange considering the fiery trial, which is to try you. You know, as a Christian lives their faith, suffering is a part of that life. Any Christian that's going to live out their faith must understand that suffering is a byproduct of that life. There is no one that has ever lived out their faith that has not gone through a time of suffering. Nobody. I don't care what time of history you're living in. Not all the suffering is the same as persecution. Obviously, here in America, we're not going through what the Christians in Jerusalem were going through, having to literally be scattered outside the city running for their lives. We're not running for our lives here in America. But I can tell you that if you're standing up for your faith and you're living for your faith and in your faith, there will be suffering. There will be suffering. And so Peter says, we should not be surprised by suffering in our life as Christians. Now, Peter knew what he was talking about. As I've already mentioned, Peter knew firsthand because Peter was one of those that had suffered for Christ. There was a time in his life where he was hesitant about suffering. In fact, to the point to where his close friend, Jesus, was getting on trial and being falsely accused and being condemned and being found guilty for something he never did. Peter being asked about that, are you with him? Seeing that they're just condemning anybody at this point, says, I don't even know that guy. It's not that he didn't know him, never had met him, hadn't heard his teaching. It said, I don't want to suffer like he's suffering right now. But you know, the, the moment that Jesus redeemed him and restored him in John 21, the moment that the Holy Spirit came upon him on that day of Pentecost, Peter was a totally different person. No longer was he afraid to, to suffer. He had understood. And I, I believe in those moments after restoration, I believe in those moments when maybe they were in the upper room, those 120 disciples, and as Peter was leading them, I do believe he had to stop and reflect about what he had done in his life. He had to be honest with himself about his Christian walk. And suddenly now, with a little bit better understanding about suffering, he writes and says, don't be surprised by suffering. It's part of this life. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 29, Peter begins to preach to the Pharisees, to the very people that had falsely accused Jesus and that had crucified Jesus. And he's preaching to not just those Pharisees, but the crowd that was around the Pharisees. And he begins to be very direct with them about who Jesus is and why Jesus lived and why Jesus gave his life on the cross and who it was that falsely condemned him and why that was necessary for the forgiveness of sins. And when you get to verse number 40, at this point, the leaders get tired of his preaching and they arrest him. And they arrest those apostles that were with him sharing the message of Jesus. And notice, I put it in your notes in verse number 40. It says, and to him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, 
they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So here's Peter, years later, reflecting upon that. That did. That just happened a few weeks after Pentecost. He's writing this letter years after this incident, and he's saying, Beloved, my dearly loved ones, think about this. Just understand that you ought not be surprised when suffering comes just because you're living for Jesus. Don't be surprised about it. It's part of the cross. It's the part of the cross that many don't want to accept. Part of the cross that many don't want to follow after. I have found that it's really easy to wear a necklace with a, with a cross uh, on around your neck. It's easy to write the little fish or put something on our car or on Facebook. It's easy to do some of that stuff. It really is. But it's a lot more difficult to actually live out our faith and stand with Christ. It's a lot more difficult to to wear that cross when they're putting people in jail for that cross. Let's just be honest, it is. And Peter says, don't be surprised because that is part of the cross in which you are called to bear. A young man came to Jesus one day and said, hey, I, I want to be a follower of yours. I want to have and inherit eternal life. I want the kingdom of God and and Jesus said, okay, you really want that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want that more than that? Oh, yeah, I want that more than anything. He said, sell everything then that you have. Give it all the poor and then follow me. He says, and then take up your cross. Notice in Mark chapter 10 and verse 21. He says, sell whatsoever thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come, take up the cross and follow me. The next verse says, and he walked away sad because he had many possessions, many treasures. He was very rich. You see, he, he wanted all to do with Jesus because he had seen the miracles and he had, he had seen the crowds and he thought, man, that looks pretty awesome. That, that looks great. But when it came to actually taking up the cross, he couldn't do it. Nobody was threatening him with prison. All they were threatening him was with giving away that which is temporal. They just hit him where it hurts most people in the wallet. And suddenly his faith wasn't as strong. Suddenly Jesus wasn't as important. See, the life of the cross is a life of suffering. I know we wear it today, now, but the cross in those days was a symbol of shame. It was a symbol of unrighteousness. It was a, a symbol of criminality. Kind of like walking around in an orange jumpsuit with handcuffs. We wouldn't wear that to a banquet. We wouldn't go that way, dress that way. We wouldn't want people to perceive us that way. We'd say, who wants to be a criminal? No. That's what the cross was. And Jesus told his followers, take up the cross and follow me. So Peter says, I want you to think about this as you live out your faith. Think. Think it not strange. Don't be surprised when suffering comes as a result of living your faith. Secondly, you ought to think about the fact that we are to rejoice when suffering. It says in verse 13, don't think it strange, but rejoice. In as much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering. Now, I just want to say, as we think about this, that Peter's not saying we ought to be laughing and giggling and enjoying physical punishment. Can I say that when they were beating these apostles, when, when Peter was getting beaten with, with, with the rod and with whips, he wasn't laughing. I imagine he was yelling like I would be yelling. Ah! Just, it hurts. I'm sure he was sore and bruised up. And swelling up from the beats, beaten that he had taken. You know, yesterday I was, uh, or day before yesterday, I was over here uh, playing in the life, Family Life Center. I was playing uh, some soccer with, with my boys, and I thought I would show them a little bit of my Ronaldo Messi moves. And um, I don't know what happened, but my upper body kept going forward, but my lower body stayed behind me. And uh, 
I landed on my elbow. I landed on my knee. I got this big scrape over here. I got a big scrape on my knee. And it really hurts today. And I fell on my own. You know, it makes me think about the beatings that Peter was taking. He was feeling that days after. So when he says, but rejoice, it wasn't rejoicing in the fact that I feel so good. You know, rejoicing is not a result of circumstances. Rejoicing is an attitude. It's a choice. You know what? What he says that we should be rejoicing in is that we are partakers in Christ's sufferings. In other words, we are identifying with Christ. That's where the joy comes in. In verse number 41, Acts 5, it says, And they departed from the presence of the council. Now, how they're departing here, just remember, they had just gotten beaten in verse number 40, so they're probably limping away. Luke didn't go into that much detail. He just said they departed. They're probably limping away from the council, but they were rejoicing that they would count it worthy to suffer shame for his name. See, the apostles found great joy in the fact that they could be found worthy to suffer for Jesus. Once again, rejoicing is a matter of attitude, not circumstance. So what Peter is saying As you're reflecting upon suffering in your life, number one, don't be surprised by it. And number two, if I can say it this way, check your attitude. What are you rejoicing in through that suffering? Because it'll tell you where your eyes are at. Tells you where your hope is at. Tells us where our mind is at, our attitude. If it's on us and the bruises, or is it on Jesus and his name? I love what John Phillips writes in his commentary on this portion of 1 Peter. He says, Peter's words here in this letter were nor no mere pious platitudes. He knew from personal experience that such gladness and boldness worked. What can the devil do with such men? You lock them up in prison and they win their jailers to court Christ. Or they spend their time writing deathless epistles that expose all of Satan's wiles. Turn them loose and they turn the world upside down. Beat them and you make them partakers of Christ's sufferings and fill their souls with song. Kill them and you promote them to glory and make them candidates for a martyr's crown. What can you do for those that are suffering for Christ's sake? There's nothing. There's nothing but good. Not good in the circumstance, no. But there's nothing but good in rejoicing, being a partaker with Christ, identifying with him. So the first thing we must do is examine our attitudes. Number two, examine our actions. In verse number 15, Peter continues to write, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer as, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Examine our actions. Peter moves from attitudes to actions. And there is a suffering that is not good and one that we cannot rejoice in. And that's really what Peter wants to make sure that those that are reading this letter understand. That is a suffering that is a consequence of our wrong actions. He said there are are sufferings and times of suffering in our life that it's not because of Christ, it's not because of our faith, it's because we've made wrong decisions and, and made wrong choices. And there's no rejoicing in that. And so Peter wants to make sure that he emphasizes this to to those that are reading this letter. And he uses various examples. He says, don't be Don't be suffering for being a murderer or a thief. Don't be suffering for being an evildoer. Don't be suffering for being a busybody. Be be a sufferer for good, not for evil. 
And so as we examine our actions, there's two questions in suffering that we ought to ask. Number one, is this a consequence of my actions? You got to ask yourself, as you're going through suffering, is this a consequence of my actions? Now, Peter was writing to Christians with all kinds of backgrounds. Some were coming from cultures that were completely pagan, immoral, unjust. In, in the Roman culture, for instance, vendettas were kind of like normal. Someone uh, did something to your family and killed a family member. Hey, you go and you get vengeance on them. That's your right. That's what the culture taught. That was the Roman culture. So you can just imagine when now a Christian comes into that culture, something happens to a family, they're suffering a difficult time, and the Christian says, whoa, 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 vengeance belongs to the Lord. Huh? What are you talking about? No, 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 no. Eye for an eye. No, no, no. The law says I can do this. If I see that guy, I'm going to look for him. If I see him in the marketplace, he, he better run faster than I am. And, and, and Peter's saying, listen, that, don't suffer for that. There were others that were coming from cultures that sealing was okay. Harming others was something regular. That word busybody is getting in the affairs of others. Peter's just simply saying, those lifestyles bring suffering, but you can't rejoice in those sufferings. Those are a result of your action. So as we examine our actions, we have to ask ourselves, is what I'm suffering a consequence of my action? Is this suffering something I brought upon myself? Now, if we could honestly say no to that, then here comes the second question, and Peter addresses this in verse 15, and that is, does God receive glory from what I'm doing? Does God receive glory from what I'm doing? Verse 16, yet if any man suffer as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, a little Christ, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Now, the goal for any Christian is to do what we do for the glory of God. That should be our end game. And everything we do, no matter if we're at work, uh, Paul's told the the church in Corinth in in, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 40, all, everything you do, do all to the glory of God. Whether you're eating, whether you're drinking, whatever it is, do all to the glory of God. One of the Apostles' Creed says uh, that the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy God. So as we're going through suffering, if we say this suffering is not a result of a a bad action, a wrong decision, a sin in my life, then we have to say, then the action that I'm doing, is it bringing glory to God or not? In other words, we're not just going to suffer for the fun of it. We don't look for suffering just for the sake of suffering. Now, there are some Christians that don't have the glory of God in mind. Usually, they'll have their own reputation in mind. They have their own self-glory in mind, and they'll start acting upon something. They'll get into other people's affairs that have nothing to do with them. That's what it's called, a busy body. And Peter says they're getting into things, and, and there's no glory for God in that. Not only does the world not glorify God, but not even the church is getting Something that will glorify God. I I remember years ago, I don't know how many of y'all remember this, but uh, Westboro Baptist Church. uh, It's not a Baptist church like our Baptist church. I want to clarify that. They are, I don't know why they have the name Baptist. I wish they'd drop it. But but, but this church had it within them. And when people are going through suffering difficulty, they're just going to go and protest. They would protest military deaths, men that had died in the service. They would go to uh, people that had been victims of of crimes, a lot of them have been uh, were homosexual, and they had been murdered for uh, that lifestyle, and and they thought, well, let's just go and protest at the funeral in front of the families, and all in the name of righteousness, they would say. And the fact of the matter is, and what they did, it brought no glory to God. It was all about them and their church and their little agenda. 
And that's why Peter says, don't suffer for being a murderer and a thief. That's not suffering going and, oh man, we, uh, we, we got to stand up for what the Bible says. And, and so we're going to go and protest these people and just be jerks. And then say, oh, we're suffering for what is right. No, you're not. You're not bringing glory to God. You're being a disgrace to the name of Christian. And that's why Peter says to those reading this letter, if any man suffer as a Christian, because he's praying, because he's loving, because he's serving, because he's having God as the priority in his life. And, and though things aren't the best right now, and though he's going through trials and difficulties, God is still there. And he's still strong and firm in his faith. And you're suffering because of that, then God will get some glory. Maybe the news won't interview you, and, and they might not glorify God through what you're doing, but God receives that glory. So you ask yourself, is God receiving glory from what I'm doing? Suffering for God's glory means doing what he has commanded us to do and doing it with honor and passion, doing it with his purposes and his will in mind. That's why Peter says at the end of verse 16, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Then notice in verse 17 that he says, also examine the outcome. Examine your attitudes in suffering. Examine your actions in suffering, but examine the outcome. The outcome of actions. You see, he comes back to this final thought of God will judge all the world. Now the word judge means the process by which a verdict is reached. And both the church and the world will be judged by God. That, that's why he says, look, notice what he says in verse 17. For that time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Who is the house of God? It's us, his people. Judgment must begin at the house of God. You see, sometimes as Christians, if we're not careful, we, we, we pretend like we're never going to be judged. And listen, we're not going to be condemned, but we will be judged. We will be evaluated. I always like to think of it sort of if you've ever coached a team. You know what the coach is? He's a judge. He's judging who should be on the floor and who needs to be on the bench. He's judging who's giving everything they've got and who's kind of just trying to get by. Though the, the coach isn't going to kick you off the team, but he might put you on the bench. He's just kind of judging to see what you're doing. And see, in the house of God, that's what God does to his people. For those whom he loves, he disciplines. So he's judging us. And Peter reminds the church, listen, judgment starts at the house of God. And God is a righteous and holy judge. That means there's no bias. There's no wrongfulness in his verdict. So God's house is judged first. In other words, God's going to judge our motives, our hearts, our actions. That's what God judges. That's why the Bible speaks so many times about our motives and our heart and our actions. Because God's going to be judging that. He's going to determine if our actions were done for his glory or for ours. He's going to judge if really we were giving with a loving heart, a wholeheartedness towards him, or if we were doing it just so that we can check something off of our list. Listen, we, we, we pray for the offering every Sunday because we want to make sure that our hearts in putting that money and giving that money to God, that our hearts are right that we're doing it out of heart of love. And we want God to bless that heart, that action. If it wasn't that important, we wouldn't even pray about it. If it was just something we had to get done, we'll just put the plates in the back and whenever you give, give. But giving is more than that. That's why Peter reminds those that are going through suffering, listen, listen, 
Examine what the outcome is of this suffering. Understand you're going to be judged on how you reacted to this suffering. You're going to be judged by the attitudes that you had during this suffering. You're going to be judged by what you were doing. Was it for God's glory or was it not? Then he finishes there in the verse, verse 17. Now, if it first begins at God's house, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? The ungodly, in other words, will be judged according to their righteousness. Now let me just say that the Bible says this, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. So when we say the the ungodly will be judged by their righteousness, in other words, by what they do, and nothing that they've done is righteous. In the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah, God said, even your good works are as filthy rags. The unrighteous, no matter what they do, it never pleases God. You say, well, if nobody is, is, uh, can, can, can be righteous that way, and nobody can do good, how come you as Christians say that you are righteous? The only way that we're righteous isn't by our good works, it's by the work of Christ on the cross for us. Notice I put this in your notes, Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified, that is being made righteous. That's what justified means. Declare not guilty. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So Peter says, you know, judgment starts at the house of God. We've been made righteous. So our actions will be weighed and our motives will be weighed, but those that are not in Christ, they're going to be judged. Judged severely by one that is holy and pure. He says that should be scary. Verse 18, and if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Examine the outcome. Then notice, lastly, that he ends this part of the letter by encouraging us to exercise obedience. A final reflective thought on suffering as we examine our attitudes and our actions, as we examine what the outcome is, then the result should be to exercise obedience. Notice what Paul writes. He says, wherefore, that word wherefore is kind of connecting everything before. Like, here's why I said all that. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. How do we do that? How is it that we exercise obedience, number one, by committing our way to God? This means we are to trust God with everything that happens on our journey of the Christian life. Some things we might understand in times of suffering. Some things that we won't understand. But most things we can't understand. I'll say that again. Some things we will understand. Some things we won't understand. But most most things we can't understand. It's just above us. I believe that's why God sometimes doesn't even bother. If you're a parent, you know how that is, right? You know, your children, they're asking you all kinds of these questions right now. My kids are on that phase. And it's kind of like, dude, you're not going to understand. But why? Uh, you ever uh, had to try to like download something that's not downloading? And then the kid's like, Dad, how come this is not downloading? I don't know. Well, then you find out it's not connected and linked to this account. And this account needs certain permissions and you need a passcode. And you explain that to a 10-year-old and he goes, huh? Yeah, but, but, but why? And at the end you go, it's just not working, son. All right? I don't know. Just download something else. Go play something else. I don't know. Not even bother with it. I think there's times that we go through suffering where God just says, listen, 
You're not going to understand. You can't. Okay? What you can understand, I'll try to explain to you. But most of it you can't. Yet, our response should be to believe, trust, and obey. We got to believe that God does all things well. Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. How do we exercise obedience? Peter says, commit thy soul to his way. Committing our way to God, but number two, remember that he is the creator. Now this thought is difficult for us to accept so many times. We can recognize our limitations, but we still feel that we should know everything, right? We, 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 would, we would probably all confess, yeah, God is all knowing. Yeah, God's thoughts are above our thoughts, but I still want to know why, right? Going through suffering, yeah, yeah, God knows more than us, but you know, why don't you try me though, God? Just tell me and then I'll, I'll let you know if I really understand or don't understand. I still want to know. Let me have a crack at it. We, we think that way. I know I'm not the only one. I can't be the only one. I hope I'm not the only one. But just looking at our creation, we understand God's omniscient and omnipotent. And we'll never be that. So you ought to exercise obedience just thinking about, listen, (laughs) that's who he is. We have trouble just getting to the moon. He hung the moon. We've never been to a star. Closest one is... Is it 93 billion miles away? Something like that. How far is the sun? 93 billion, something like that. That's as close as we've ever been. He's a creator. Peter says, that's why you exercise obedience. Because God does all things well. I, I love the, the hymn by Fanny Crosby. By the way, if you don't know Fanny Crosby, you should look her up on Google. Amazing woman. She was the hill song of her day, okay? Or uh, the Getty music of her day. I don't know, whatever your, your favorite band is, okay? Christian band. That's who she was. Over 250 hymns in our hymnals were written by Fanny Crosby. Amazing, amazing. She was blind when she was a little baby. And even with that disability, she said it was the greatest thing to ever happen to me. She said, I've I've been able to do more for God than if I ever had my eyes. It's incredible, her testimony. But she wrote this song, and I love this song. We we sing it sometimes in our services, all the way my Savior leads me. All the way my Savior leads me. What have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercy, who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divine is comfort, here by faith in him to dwell. For I know whatever befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. For I know whatever befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. That's all Peter was saying. You're going through suffering now. Stop and reflect. Are you rejoicing in it? Is it a result of your action? Are you going through this for God's glory? And if it's for God's glory, isn't it worth it? If it's for God's glory, it's glorious. Examine the outcome of that. Think of the day that you're standing before God, because we will stand. Think of that day and think, what will I answer? He knows your heart. He knows my heart. You're not going to fool him. You can't lie to him. You can't say, man, it was for you when it wasn't. I know I use parenting a lot, but you ever ever had a, your son or daughter lie to you, and you know they're lying. And then you just start 
quizzing them. You're not even grilling them. You're just quizzing them. And you went with who? Oh. What, t- what time was that? Oh. You already saw the text. You know where they were at. You know what time. But you're just questioning them. And the whole time you're sitting there going, I know you're lying to me. And you keep just questioning them until finally they have to confess. No, no, Dad, I, I wasn't there. Oh. And I think about that because when we stand before God, that's what it's going to be. You can have your little plan right now and say, this is what I'm going to tell God. I, I know. He's going to look at you and just go, I know your heart. You're not, you're not fooling me. So what are we to do during suffering? Exercise obedience. I'll leave you with this because time has gotten away from us. I found this in the Revised Expositor's Bible Commentary. And the author said this. He says, suffer in silence, but get on with the job of living an active life of good deeds. Christians should be known for what they do, not for what they suffer. Fixation upon the difficulties of life robs the believer of the opportunity to display his concern for the welfare of others. I would just add to that, exercise obedience for the glory of God and for the blessing of others. That's what we're to do as we reflect on suffering. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your truth and your word. Father, as we stop and reflect even this morning, I don't know how many are going through a time of suffering even now. I do know that some are suffering with difficult health. Some are facing difficulties in their families and some are in times of suffering because of the circumstances that they're in. Father, whatever the suffering may be this morning, I pray that you would help each and every one of us to be reflective about that suffering pray that you would empower us and strengthen us to rejoice in this suffering. Though in the moment it doesn't feel great. Though in the moment we wish that we could fly away somewhere else and be somewhere else. Yet Father you have called us not to run but to endure. And so Father I pray that we would that we would rejoice in that time of enduring. Pray that you would help us to examine our our actions. To be honest with ourselves, if what we're going through is really a result of a lack of faith, not a result of our Christian and Christ-like mindedness, but selfishness or carnality that's made its way through in our life and maybe that's why we're suffering Father if that be the case forgive us cleanse us purify us but Father if it is that we're suffering for doing your will Father I pray that you would be glorified pray that others would see you more clearly us to remember where that leads us at the end of all things. And knowing all that we know and being reflective upon all that we've seen in your word, then help us to obey. Help us to commit our ways to you and remember that you are the creator. Oh, Father, I pray that you would work in our hearts and in our lives. Help us to follow you faithfully. to enjoy you. Help us to glorify you. Father, thank you for your word. Father, thank you for suffering. Not just your suffering on the cross, but allowing us to suffer so that we might identify with you. So that we might share 
with you. Be with us now this week and help us, Father, to apply these tests into our lives. So we reflective in our suffering, I ask. In Jesus' precious name.